Okay, we might we'll get going. Um, so we're just going to do a little quick Q and A session. I'm hoping um, there's some people here in the crowd that have got a burning question for us. Um, if the speaker, if you're answering a question, you're going to just have to stand up so that the um, the camera up the back can grab you. Um, so yeah, far away. What questions have we got? I was just going to ask Warwick, uh, is it feasible that in the future farmers at an individual level are going to have to show a reduction in emissions or uh, like yeah. that, that we started out at a certain level now and in so many years' time it's got to be less? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, it's not like carbon sequestration where it doesn't matter where you start, you've got to keep making gains. With emissions reduction, it'll be benchmarked against what is a typical uh, emission intensity for, a, for, for the industry. Say, if you're in land production and you've got an emission intensity of six kilograms of CO2e per kilogram of product, you're probably going to be right, but if you're at eight, then you gotta have to you might not have access to markets, if, if that makes sense. So it it's it sort of doesn't matter where you start, it's it's about the number that you keep producing each year. And so there'll be an incentive and, and I guess what will happen over time is what's expected of you will come down as as, uh, as everyone else comes down and as there's more technology coming online to help you reduce that further. So I, th I think that's how it will affect you at the present. So if you're really efficient now, there's not going to be any penalty for you. There's going to be lots of opportunity. Um, this one's for Warwick as well. Um, when you talked about what producers should be doing on farm for emission reductions over the next five years, you mentioned ASBVs. Um, were the current breeding values that you're referring to um, like fast growth rates or were you saying that there might be a methane efficiency breeding value developed in the future? Yeah, there's, um, there's projects at the moment to develop uh, ASVBs or, or breeding values for methane for both sheep and for cattle. So at the moment, we don't really, ha we, we don't have breeding values for those, so we, we actually couldn't document what is, um, using a genetic test, what is a, uh, some, uh, some genetic animals that, that have high efficiency for methane versus low. Um, but through this project, the, the first phase of that will be finished in um, I don't know, it's one, about 18 months time for those two projects, uh, and then they'll have some early stage of those values out. But then we've got the net zero ag CRC coming online, which is a 10 year investment of about $300 million <coughs> into all of these strategies. And genetics is one of the strategies that we'll be focused on through there as well to further that, that type of approach. Warwick, uh, yeah, just a question for you. Just make sure I'm on the right page here. One of the um, uh, slides you had up there was the livestock greenhouse emissions, um, and there was Merino sheep, for example, was up around 18 of the CO2 per tonne of production. And then you had uh, the uh, prime land production was down around 12. The average thing I'm going, well, how's an old, you know, 60 kilo, 50 kilo weather out the back of, you know, hay there? Why is his permission so much higher than a, than a, than a lamb in a feedlot type thing? <laughs> yeah, good question. Um, so when you look at sheep production, we've got two products that are coming off that. We've got wool and then we've got meat production. And so when you're looking at merino, uh, and so wool's about 30 kilograms of CO2e per kilogram of product, where meat production, as I said, sort of around that seven to, to uh, sort of eight to six. So it's, it's really, that's a different proportions of those um, in, in, in that livestock system. So a merino system is making more from the wool side, generally than, than the meat side. I know that's sort of changing over time and that, that's, that data that I presented there is over 10 years old now. Um, but yeah, generally the, the land production is, is more efficient because more meat's being produced and that has a lower emissions intensity compared to the wool side. Um, 
just another point that sort of emphasises this. When you look at the livestock emissions industry change and reduction over time, the biggest driver of that was actually the reduction in the floor price, uh, the removal of the wool floor price, which basically where weathers went out of our system and we went into um, into breeding ewes. And that's, we, we got, over time, that's resulted in about 25% reduction in emissions for livestock systems. Um, and so that's something that's sort of not related to, to methane, but we sort of need that same level of magnitude over the next 10 years to, which when you think about that change is a massive change to an industry. Uh, how, how are we going to achieve that in, in the next 10 years? Uh, to Warwick again. Um, as far as I can see it, the methane is in a stable system. It's a 12-year cycle. So I suppose what I don't understand is why didn't, uh, why has the industry been imposed upon that that reduction when, if it's based on, uh, was it based on 1990 figures or uh, was that, what was the original starting point? And shouldn't, surely that reflects the number of livestock in Australia. And so, if it goes up, obviously the methane goes up, but if it goes down, uh, the, the stock numbers, uh, the methane emissions would go down. So uh, how did they, why did they work out this 43% or whatever it is, methane reduction that, uh, that was imposed uh, when it's just, uh, when, it's a, when it's a closed system? Yeah, that, that's a really interesting argument. Um, it, I, I guess that methane pledge is sort of, it's mapped back to that 2050 and what's needed to achieve that. And so they weren't thinking about livestock systems in Australia when they were setting that target. They were thinking about how is methane um, emitted globally and what's, what could we achieve to get it down? And they realised that they couldn't get it to zero. So it's sort of like what? what's a realistic number, or it might not even be realistic, but what's a number we, we, we want to try and pledge to get to? So it's like an aspirational target. It's not, a, it's not set in stone that that's what we have to get to, but that's their aspirational target. The, the second bit around that argument is um, there's, there's been a few people arguing that for the exact reason that you said, because uh, methane is a short-lived gas, if we don't change our, our numbers, then over 12 years there's no extra methane being emitted into the... So, so there's no increase from methane in, into the... But we've still got the same level of methane in, in, in the atmosphere and it's it's like sort of saying to the power stations, oh, you had this level of emissions at this period in the past. Um, they might be back around there now, but you can't stop at that. We, we need to go back to something that's a lot lower um, or otherwise we, we're not going to make the changes we need to globally. And so uh, this has been, I suppose, mapped back and, and, and modelled out, uh, and I've had colleagues working on this in the IPCC who, who've said we, we absolutely have to work on livestock emissions or we've got no hope of actually making that net zero target. So it's the thing where everyone has to chip in and do it, and um, as an industry, we we can't say that we're different because any other industry can say that they're different and do the same thing. And so, it, unfortunately, there, there is going to be a real change. Like, it, this will have a really big impact as an industry because um, as it's having with our transport sector, as it's having with, with uh, other sectors, um, it, it really will have a big influence on us. Uh, yeah. Um, I once heard it... Um, somebody say that um, aside from termites, ruminants are basically the only part of our natural environment that recycles cellulose um, out, you know, which would otherwise probably enter the atmosphere as carbon dioxide or methane by rotting or burning, um, that ruminants actually turn that into a high product high quality protein product and um, methane is 
a, a byproduct of that and has always been a byproduct of that. So that we're, um, if we manage the system well, a certain amount of methane is to be expected. I totally agree. <laughs> so I don't actually disagree with what you're saying at all, and I'm not, I'm not here trying to defend the rules. I guess it's it's just what's coming, and um, and what we need to do to do these analysis well. You you need to understand what you would do if you wouldn't um, if you weren't going to have uh, ruminant production. When you look at that as a scenario, you're cropping a massive area. Of really of country that is not suited to, to cropping, you're knocking down a whole heap of rainforest in Brazil to do that, to feed the world. All of these things compound. So, um, when you hear the simple answer that we just need to eat, um, be or be, be vegetarians, or we need to or we need to get rid of rumors, that's not telling you the true story of what happens with a true um, change because you you actually need to understand the full emissions profile that would happen if you did that large scale, and, and often that, ha that, that will have devastating outcomes for the environment in many different ways, um, as, well as, carbon, uh, as well as still having some carbon emissions. Mine's for you too, sorry. Um, how important do you think um, quality of forage is in terms of methane production? Um, obviously, there's vast differences from that way to this way um, across the state. And um, from my understanding of what I just learned at uni, um, they kind of said that higher quality forages produce less methane because the rumination rate is faster, so they're moving through it more quickly and they're not producing as much methane because they're not fermenting as much. Um, how much do you think that like these factors will play into it in the future? They're really important. Um, and efficiency, as was one of my main points today, which is really from high quality diets and, and having efficient animals to utilise those high quality diets, is actually a core pillar in what we need to be doing going forward. Um, just to sort of back up your point, we I've been running a grazing trial in Orange for a long period of time and we did some um, <coughs> emissions modelling on the lamb growth rates on that trial. <clears throat> and once they drop below about 100 grams a day, so you can think of that of any growing stock, the methane em emissions intensity exponentially increases. And so think of that if, if you, say, lost weight in animals and had to fatten them again, you've, you've more than doubled the emissions. You've, you've probably 10 times the emissions on those animals from a really efficient growth path. So that's why things like supplementary feeding to keep them going at that rate is actually going to become a really important part in the future because you'll be rewarded for that, not only from a, the animals you're getting off at, a, at an optimum sort of state, but, but also hopefully with a carbon price because you've got them at a really low benchmark for emissions intensity. No, you can sit down. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we'll give Warwick a bit of a spell. Um, Ash, the elephant in the room, it's a big one. I mean, your presentation was very clear. It's here, just about. So um, do you think the producers are ready for it, particularly out in the Western areas? That's an excellent question, and I don't really have a straightforward answer to that. Uh, feedback that we've been getting is really mixed. We have uh, so many more producers than I, I would have thought that are already using EID, that have jumped on the bandwagon early and um, are, are already well down that path. And there is still a lot of resistance that exists in industry. Um, but I, I do believe that the information's out there. Everyone knows it's coming. Uh, understanding sort of the why behind it. Uh, I, I think a lot of that information is, is really getting out there and, and I do believe that, that adoption is, is going to happen and, and we will be okay. Um, but yeah, not, not denying that there is still some resistance to it. 
Ash, I'd like to, David Robertson, I'd like to ask you about uh, technology, low frequency and high frequency readers. Where are we at with that? And are they um, going to move to high frequency and the advantages of it? Yep, thanks for the question. So um, at this stage, high frequency in terms of animal identification is not an option. So in Australia, none of our tag manufacturers produce a high frequency option. So we only have the, the low frequency tags available, which is the same technology that's been used in cattle um, for about 20 years, cattle have had EID. So I think changing from low to high now would not be an easy decision to make as it ha would have quite large implications, given that low frequency is what we have been using all this time, and the, the technology behind it is different. So all the readers that everyone has had for years, again, for, for cattle um, and now for sheep and goats would have to be changed if it were to go to high frequency. Sorry. Can you tell us all the advantages of high frequency readers? Um, I'm not up on all of the specs of high frequency, but I do believe that uh, they are more capable of reading sort of multiple tags in, in faster. Sorry? Yes, yep. Um, and they also have the ability of storing some information in the tag itself, whereas with the low frequency, you scan it you then store all your information in, in your software. It seems to be a bit of a no-brainer to go to high frequency at the start of a conversion with all the advantages. Well, the start was 20 years ago when the cattle industry adopted it. Not for sheep. Adopted it's, com it. it's compulsory for us next year. Yes, but the, the low frequency technology has been out there for a long, long time. And so bringing high frequency in now, um, I believe would cause a lot of disruption because that's not the technology that industry has been preparing for. Whilst, yes. We might um, pull that one up there for the moment. <laughs> we can have that discussion afterwards, yep. I think. Um, yeah. Yeah. Got a question mark? You're always sh not short of words, normally. I actually have to go back to my phone. Again, sorry, Warwick, it's for you, mate. Um, <coughs> it's not one that I, we've talked about before, but um, room and microbes uh, and adaptation. So there's been this discussion that over a period of time, depending on whether it's a pasture or whether it's um, an additive, <coughs> that the room and microbes will change and, and potentially work out a way around that, that intervention. Have you got any commentary about that? Yeah, thanks for that one. Um, <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's... The rumen is... It's it's, a, it's its own environment and ecosystem, so and it's like all resistance type... Like, they will find ways around the... Because it's it's a mechanism that, that's been developed. Um, so... so um, if we're relying, say, on a single compound to get methane reduction, the, the bugs will probably evolve to, to get around that. Um, so what that means is we need to have a really detailed understanding of the me mechanism, how it works, um, for supplements and for pastures. The early indication from pastures is that it's not a single com um, compound. It's actually probably likely to be three, at least three compounds, or how those compounds actually affect pH in the room. Like it's, it's actually very complex. So the advantage of that is it will be harder for evolution to get around that quickly. Um, so if we can understand those mechanisms, um, then we will have a lot more confidence describing that something will continue to happen into the future. At low uh, cost, monitoring of methane will will absolutely be, have to be part of this in the future. Very good. That's the end of our Q and A session. We might just um, grab Hannah and uh, a couple of gifts for our speakers and thanks for their time today and yesterday. 
and um, we might put our hands together and thank him for us. Thanks.